So great. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'd like to start by thanking our Market Links colleagues for making today's webinar possible. We're very much looking forward to today's conversation about local and regional manufacturing and the systems needed to ensure the quality of products, regulate supply, and promote the safe and appropriate use by individuals. And if we could just go to the next slide, please. All right, great. And actually we can proceed to the next slide. Wonderful. So it's my pleasure today to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Christine Milotti, a senior clinical pharmacist in USAID's Bureau for Global Health in the Office of HIV AIDS. She serves as the contracting officer's representative for the Global Health Supply Chain Quality Assurance Contract. Her responsibilities include providing technical support on determining eligible quality assured vendors and supplier relationship management. She's also the primary reviewer of ADS 312 requests for pharmaceuticals for the agency. Thank you, Allison. And I'd like to introduce you as well. Allison Collins is a health systems advisor with the USAID Office of Health Systems and the Bureau for Global Health. She currently serves as the AOR for the Promoting the Quality of Medicines Plus program and provides technical support in the areas of health system strengthening, pharmaceutical system strengthening, and COVID-19 prevention and response. Thank you, Christine. So we appreciate that it can be confusing to follow the various projects that are working in the quality assurance space. So simply put, the Global Health Supply Chain Quality Assurance or GHSC QA program and the Promoting the Quality of Medicines Plus or PQM Plus program both contribute to the overarching goal of increasing the supply of quality assured medicines used in global health programs, enabling the international donor community to procure quality assured commodities. Next slide, please. Over the next 90 minutes, we have quite a robust task ahead of us to explore the current supply chain landscape and pain points, including um, all pain points for products that are critical for USAID's global health programs, not just pharmaceuticals. Um, we hope to articulate the challenges as well as the opportunities associated with local and regional production. And, and for those who have just recently joined, we're inviting you to participate in our poll to help um, garner feedback from the, the audience on this topic, um, because we at USCID are in the process of defining our position on local production, and we are hopefully using this um, forum as an opportunity to, to gain insight and, um, and feedback. Um, and so we're going to be uh, soliciting feedback, not only from this forum, but other um, groups through both internal and external fora. Um, and then we hope to share USAID's approach to procurement from local vendors and results from various technical assistance efforts and how um, these efforts have yielded um, several qualified sources. Um, we want to underscore the importance of a strong regulatory system as an enabling factor for local production. And finally, identify procurement policy reform that would promote and enable an environment for local procurement. Next slide, please. So as you're all aware, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted numerous vulnerabilities within the global health supply chain, such as the significant um, geographical concentration of manufacturing in various countries in Asia. And in line with the agency's goal to localize its investments across our development programs, USAID endeavors to support local and regional manufacturing of safe and effective health products and LICs to diversify the supply base and promote enhanced access to quality assured medicines and health products that are geographically closer to the end user, whether it's a, a patient or a recipient. In May of 2012, the World Health Embassy the World Health Assembly passed a resolution on strengthening local production of medicines and other health technologies to improve access. The US government signed on to the resolution and the interagency led by the National Security Council is seeking to strengthen its support for local production. And um, we'll be happy to provide a copy of this resolution at the end of the presentation. Um, but this document, if you haven't had a chance to review it, it presents many potential benefits, but also risks, which we will explore further today. To increase local production requires a holistic approach 
that encompasses a focus on number one, policy, two, regulatory system strengthening, three, capacity building, four, technical assistance, and five, finance. Next slide, please. Great. Over the past two decades, USAID has invested in increasing the global supply of quality assured essential medicines and other medical products for priority disease areas, including through technical assistance to manufacturers in low and middle income countries. This work helps expand supply, can reduce prices, and prepares health systems to withstand supply chain disruptions, like we've observed with COVID-19. The PQM Plus program is currently supporting more than 50 manufacturers and LMICs to help them develop and receive approval for quality assured essential medicines and other medical products. And the GHS CQA mechanism has also provided technical assistance to a handful of manufacturers. So I'd like to just briefly share a couple of examples to illustrate the impact of this work. First, USAID has worked to increase supply to avert global shortages of critical life-saving anti-TB medicines. And 30% of the current active pharmaceutical ingredients or APIs for anti-TB medicines that have achieved WHO pre-qualification were supported by PQM Plus and its predecessor, PQM. More recently, related to COVID-19, PQM Plus helped Pakistani manufacturers meet international quality standards, or PPE, reducing the price of N95 masks there by more than 95% and greatly expanding access. And in South Africa, USAID's Project Last Smile supported small and medium-sized enterprises to stimulate local production of essential COVID-19 supplies and PPE, generating over 1.9 million pieces of PPE, creating 426 employment opportunities, and leveraging 1.3 million in co-financing. As Christine said, this work is complemented by USAID's investments in strengthening national and regional regulatory authorities supply chain management and pharmacy management systems to accelerate access to and appropriate use of quality products that are safe, effective, and affordable, and to facilitate a viable marketplace for manufacturers of quality products, while also removing substandard and falsified products from the market. Next slide, please. USAID's investments focus on essential medical products for persistent public health issues, such as NTDs, TB, malaria, and maternal and child health conditions in the countries where we work. So as you can see by this table, since 2009, USAID has helped manufacturers achieve a total of 67 approvals for quality assured generic medicines or active pharmaceutical ingredients by the WHO pre-qualification program, WHO listed authorities, or national authorities. As demonstrated by this table, USAID provides TA for manufacturing of both the active pharmaceutical ingredient, or API, and the finished pharmaceutical product, FPP, helping to increase the supply of quality assured medicines used in global health programs. Next slide, please. So allow me to acquaint you with this slide. What we have here is the historical procurement data for all of our task orders that go under the Global Health Supply Chain Procurement Supply Management Contract, which is the primary vehicle for which USAID funded procurements are occurring. And so if you look at the, um, the y-axis, you'll see the total commodity costs that were procured the, fi the past five years. And so what we have here is a breakdown of the procurements that explicitly came from African manufacturers. <clears throat> you may hear us interchange African with local throughout this presentation. I think that has been um, part of the challenge is understanding that definition. But I think for this piece of data, we did wanna highlight the, the work that's been happening in the African manufacturers. And what you can see from this graph is although it's, it's, a, it's simply about 3% of the total procurements um, at $26 million of the total procurements, you can see an increasing trend over the years. And under the leadership of administrator power, we only anticipate that <clears throat> that, that would increase in the future. Um, <clears throat> the data has been grouped into these five commodity categories, the four you see on the chart plus contraceptives, but no contraceptives to date have been procured from African manufacturers and so that is why they are not visible in the key. On the right, this map depicts the value of product that based on the country of, ma of manufacture. And so what you can see here is that 
um, Nigeria and South Africa are playing the largest role in terms of providing manufactured um, goods. So with that, I'd like to turn over the conversation to our panelists. Next slide, please. Ian Barron is an expert in innovating, incubating, and scaling best practices, functions, and global health. Dr. Barton is a medical doctor with 10 years of clinical practice, 20 years in healthcare supply chain management, and two years in healthcare systems advisory. Dr. Barton has a deep and broad professional experience in both commercial and public health sectors. And before launching his organization, Health for Development, he was the CEO of the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Christy Best is a microbiologist and senior quality assurance professional with more than 30 years of experience in the pharmaceutical, food safety, medical device, and biotechnology industries. She spent 12 years working as a microbiologist and inspector for the United States Food and Drug Administration and currently works for FHI 360, where she is technical advisor for the Product Quality and Compliance Department and serves as the Deputy Project Director of USAID's Global Health Supply Chain Quality Assurance Program. Mr. Khaled Mahmoud is a Health System Strengthening Supply Chain Advisor in the Office of Health, Population, and Nutrition with USAID Pakistan. He joined USAID Pakistan in 2005 and is currently managing the health systems and strengthening portfolio with two key activities around public health supply chain and quality of medicines. Jude Nokike is a vice president at U.S. Pharmacopeia and director of the Promoting the Quality of Medicines Plus program. Mr. Nokike has more than 20 years of experience in strengthening medical products regulation and quality assurance systems and is the recipient of the 2020 IPS Medal Award, awarded by the Industrial Pharmacy Section of the International Pharmaceutical Federation. And finally, Prashant Yadav is a globally recognized scholar in the area of healthcare supply chains. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development, affiliate professor of technology and operations management at INSEAD and lecturer at Harvard Medical School. He is the author of many peer reviewed scientific publications and his work has also been featured in prominent print and broadcast media. Next slide, please. So without further ado, we would like to kick off the conversation with a question for all of our panelists about how you would define local or regional manufacturing in the context of your work and how this might have evolved over time. So Ian, if we could turn to you first to respond to this question, please. Thanks very much. And thanks for allowing me to join. It's, uh, I always enjoy doing these events, and especially when you see the, the range of personalities and people that are, that are in the, the audience. Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to see so many names that many of whom I haven't seen for a number of years. Um, that's testimony to the fact that we've all been doing this for an awful long time, um, which has got a couple of implications, but one of them is that we do start to, to lose old friends um, as we're around for longer, and, and so I just wanted to make a, a comment and a, and a moment of remembrance for Paul Farmer, uh, who's one of the, the people who taught us all so much and got us all so involved so long ago, um, and for him to have been lost earlier this week is just a, a huge tragedy, not only for the patients that he served in the markets in which he operated, but for partners in health in general, and in fact, for all of us as a community. So just a, a moment of thought around Paul, and thanks around Paul. Um, but to your question, um, how do you define local or regional manufacturing? And I love the fact that you put in there regional. I'm not sure that I like the word local. Is it domestic? I know it's hard to choose the right words, but local, it's got that sort of feeling of almost a demeaning statement. So I just, our ambition is not to build up local manufacturer. Our, our, biz, our ambition is to build businesses that are both capable of supplying their own domestic markets and their regional markets, and in fact, exporting to the world. So this is not a, it's not, it's not a, it's not a little word that we need. It's an ambitious word that we perhaps need. So that's one of the first things for me around the context, but probably the most important contextual thing that's changed and has evolved is, and this is part of the silver lining of the cloud of COVID. If you talked three years ago about domestic manufacture, you got passed on to somebody at the local registration authority or someone in the Ministry of Health. Today, regional domestic manufacture is item one on the African Union heads of state meeting at every cycle. 
it has got the level of attention that it deserves and it's got the level of momentum that it needs. The second thing that's happened is that the people having that conversation have realized that this isn't something that everybody's going to have to do their own little thing. There's going to have to be regionalized strategies in order to take the economy to scale that this, this needs. And it's going to need all the players from different angles and different aspects involved in making it work. And then the third is that everybody gets it, that this is not a one year funding cycle solution. This is going to take a 10 to 15 year journey. And there was a beautiful uh, symposium on this earlier on, which Prashant, I think, was actually on the panel. But one of the folks from India said, it took us 15 years, um, but we have to start. The last point I want to make in, in terms of this, the context is, is I, I get it, pharma's vital and vaccines are entirely logical to be in the discussion. But if we're really serious about getting from ports to arms in vaccination, if we're really serious about building robust systems, we've got to go all the way down the list. We've got to go vaccines, we've got to go OSD, we've got to go liquids and gel and creams, we've got to go diagnostics, devices, surgicals, consumables, all the way to PPE. And then we've got to go all the way from finished goods right back to raw materials. And in some cases, that means drug substance. And in some cases, that means API. And so this is, this is a big conversation, but it's now important, apparent, and getting the focus that it needs. And it's really important. And, and thank you again for, for facilitating this, because it needs lots of discussion and lots of buy-in and then for us to get on and do things differently. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ian. I think your, your point about terminology is certainly well taken. And I think something that you know, we also have debated um, quite a bit internally. So I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to you next, Christy, to hear your thoughts on this question. Great, thank you. And I echo the sentiment of being able to um, sit on this panel to have these discussions and greetings to everyone, to all the participants. Um, I think in order to understand um, our perspective, at least coming from FHI, it's important to know like what our role is. And, and currently we hold a quality assurance contract for the Global Health Supply Chain Project, where we're responsible for um, ensuring that all the pharmaceuticals and health commodities, excluding the malaria ones, regardless of where they're manufactured, if it's locally, internationally, wherever it's manufactured, that they are appropriate for intended use, they meet specifications and quality standards. That being said, um, when we're talking about the location of a manufacturing site, primarily we're taking into account the risk um, associated with that and looking into basically the, the maturity level of a regulatory authority that's overseeing that manufacturer um, and then developing the necessary risk mitigation uh, strategies that would be appropriate in that case. So then as far as the definition goes for local, I mean, quite honestly, this has been a challenge and uh, we've struggled a bit to obtain a clear definition you know, from our client's perspective, but understandably so. It, it seems that um, that terms are a bit clearer when it's in reference to an implementing partner um, for local programs, but not as clear when we're talking about commodities. Um, and so there could be a couple of ways to look at this, uh, depending on what USA's ultimate goal is, but one way could be to define local from a regulatory perspective. Uh, for example, from a regulatory perspective, local refers to a product that's manufactured in a country and registered in that same country, that same country of use. Uh, an example, um, we have injectable contraceptives, medroxyprogesterone acetate that was manufactured in Indonesia for the Indonesian market would be considered a local manufacturer. However, now that that product is being exported to other countries, uh, that could be considered regional or even international. Um, and so when we talk regional, it implies that the product is manufactured in a particular country and may be exported to other countries within that <clears throat> general locale and where there may also be more integration from a regulatory perspective based on certain associations um, 
certain associations or agreements or recognitions. Um, example, the East African community, uh, which is comprised of uh, several countries, Ken, I think Kenya, Burundi, South Sudan, <clears throat> Tanzania, and Uganda. So using a definition that's more regulatory based um, is a way to normalize the definitions of local uh, and regional without having to create artificial designations. However, the, the con to this uh, would be that it again would differ from the programmatic definitions that currently exist. Um, another option could be to, uh, to define it based on, for example, a target PEPFAR country or a country that has an active global health program. The benefit of this is that the definition is then consistent across the board from a programmatic and a commodities perspective. However, this would mean that, for example, an Indian manufacturer would be considered uh, local as USAID has local programs in India. And I'm not sure if that fully aligns with USAID's vision in looking primarily for an African-centric definition. Um, I mean, so in conclusion, from a quality assurance perspective, we will align our risk mitigation strategies around however the ultimate uh, definition is defined from a local or regional perspective. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. I think your, your points around risk mitigation and especially the, the role of a strong regulatory system are really well taken and, and critical to this conversation. Um, so Khalid, we'd like to come to you next for your thoughts on this question. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, greetings from Pakistan. I'm glad to, to join uh, this group here and happy to talk about uh, uh, our experience from Pakistan, especially the local production and other uh, questions that are coming. I think from um, missions, uh, I, I will look uh, at local production from a missions perspective, uh, where the missions strategy guides us, where our rest of the work is uh, expanding or spanning, uh, keeping in view the health system, strengthening all those pillars uh, where we are making lots of uh, uh, contribution to, uh, to service delivery, to supply chain, to quality of medicine and uh, several other technical areas. And we want to see how uh, our contribution in uh, building the capacity around local production in the country complements the rest of the work. And of course, uh, achieve the targets uh, now within, the, uh, within our mission strategy. So looking beyond the local or regional manufacturing as um, usually we perceive it as like a pr production of our patented or generic medical products that are uh, manufactured in a um, uh, local or regional territory. I think the idea is how we can ensure that uh, essential supplies are available to, uh, to people at the last mile at affordable prices and with uh, needed quality. Those are some of the key aspects that uh, if are built in within the country's capacity, uh, both in the public and the private sector, I think we will think um, we have achieved our goal to improve the local capacity. And, and I will connect here uh, this local capacity uh, concept uh, within the work that we have done in Pakistan. It's not only local capacity, because when we see that uh, our little work after the COVID pandemic struck um, globally and including Pakistan, the work that we built in, uh, working with the private sector pharmaceutical companies, uh, building their capacity to produce local PPE and local COVID treatments. So it was not local merely as production, but it helped the populations in the region as well as beyond the region globally. So uh, uh, again, semantics, the, the uh, focused definitions, I agree to, uh, uh, with uh, other colleagues, 
but i think it's it's lots of uh, uh, level of effort involved uh, when we talk about local uh, capacity and local production i will just give an example of uh, how we are creating uh, in a foothold in this complex world where we are building capacities around local production i will simply uh, state that uh, the local production or the capacity to produce locally is not only bringing uh, uh, commodities to people but it's overall bringing resilience to country systems it contributes to con uh, country's economic uh, development and job creation in pakistan it's even a little bit more complex uh, where the pharmaceutical sector is very complicated i give you a, an example um, uh, it's unprecedented there is more than 800 pharmaceuticals in pakistan and out of those 800 only top 100 uh, cater to 97% of the market the rest of uh, 700 compete for only the 3% of market share uh, in a 3.2 billion pharma industry so that's that's the kind of challenging environment where we are working and trying to uh, create uh, foothold not only to bring the capacity at a level where it uh, caters to the population needs but also it aligns uh, with our you know, missions objectives our strategies as well as uh, contributing to uh, saving life uh, in the rest of the world i'll stop here thank you thank you so much halid for sharing those rich experiences from pakistan Um Jude I'd like to turn to you next for your response to this question please. <clears throat> Hello thank you so much Alison and this is really very exciting I I I really feel uh want to thank you for inviting me very uh, wonderful panel uh, panelist co panelist and I think they've stimulated me so much by just virtue of the angles at which each and every one is taking even the question about the definition. And so um for me to turn to that same question i think you generally agree that 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 local refers to uh, could refer to location of the manufacturing it could as well also refer to the ownership of, of the business uh, but i would like to say that the term uh, uh, production as well can refer to you know the way that um, participants in the sector can progressively uh, um, approach different levels of sophistication in the operations in the pharmaceutical value chain so from import only to production of epi and fpp and then of course some form of uh, research and development work but what is often not sufficiently highlighted in the definition of local production is that the word local also refers to a focus on the burden of disease um most people will agree uh, it seems to me that the most important objective of local production is to produce the needed essential medicines close to the burden of the disease to serve the country's epidemiology as well as that of their immediate neighbors uh, so so you hear me say a few things more about this burden of disease angle but first is to say that uh, we been uh, in, in in the work we do we been working extensively on this uh for for over 12 years the pkm and pkm plus program uh has supported hundreds of manufacturers including dozens uh in china in 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 uh, india in south korea and these are the traditional export markets and so it took only until uh, probably about another 5 7 years that we started looking at this burden of disease angle the focus on the burden of disease on of their own country and the region uh, you know so how are, you know some of these manufacturers really supposed to participate in that market so i'll i'll give some few examples of that to really further uh, bring out that point so um indonesia and pakistan these are two countries where we know they have a high burden of tuberculosis and so uh, the pkm and pkm plus program have worked closely with manufacturers in those countries to get the manufacturer in indonesia to the wto pre qualification 
of a first line TB medicine. And we continue to work with Pakistan uh, to uh, ensure that they can produce up to WHO pre-qualification level, they can produce first line fixed dose combination TB medicine. Uh, Nigeria is a country where upwards of 50, uh, um, you know, products for postpartum hemorrhage and for preeclampsia were all imported until recently. We supported a manufacturer to make oxytocin and magnesium sulfate respectively. And uh, that magnesium sulfate is uh, imminently uh, going to get WHO pre-qualification. Um, Nepal, Pakistan, Nigeria, countries with high burden of neonatal sepsis, and we supported to make uh, uh, chlorhexidine available. And in fact, the manufacturer from Nigeria subsequently got, um, you know, applied, submitted their dossier to the WAHO, to the West African Health Community, and that dossier was approved. And what that translates to is that that product is likely going to make it into the 16 com member countries of the Economic Community of West Africa. Uh, Nigeria and Ghana, we all know uh, here that they have high burden of malaria, uh, not just in those two countries, but also in the region. And these are countries where we're supporting to make anti-malaria products. Uh, so some of these manufacturers have taken advantage, for instance, the example of Echlohesidin, they've taken advantage of the regional economic integration, right? They've taken advantage of that to, to really offer their products to the entire regional market. And, and you know, and as we know, is when you pull demand across countries and across regions, uh, when you get things like uh, advanced purchase commitments, uh, then you suddenly have a sizable market. And that on its own is an incentive for manufacturers to get more into the market. Um, local production becomes even much more imperative during health emergencies. You all will relate with this. That's, that's what we're officing right now. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it really happens that when you have built the fund, foundational infrastructure for adoption and compliance to international GMP quality and quality standards, you actually get these manufacturers in those countries that had not been the traditional hub for export of pharmaceuticals. You suddenly get them primed and ready to fulfill a, uh, an opportunity that may arise during health emergencies and pandemic. And an example, a quick example is in Pakistan, yeah, where you know uh, when Gilead signed the voluntary licensing agreement with uh, Beer Biosciences, uh, which is a subsidiary company of uh, Ferroxone, um, it, it provided an opportunity for that country to address their immediate need for Rendezvous. And, and, and that manufacturer was able, with BKM Plus support, to produce this product, um, uh, use it for local needs, uh, thanks again also even to support from our uh, fellow panelists here, our lead. And also that product is benefiting a host of other countries. It's been distributed uh, to dozens of uh, countries and uh, um, used to treat uh, nearly 80,000 patients. Um, and, 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 and similarly, PKM Plus work has really uh, provided a platform as well for other things that may emerge in COVID-19 therapeutics. As much as, uh, if I recollect well now, six out of the 27 manufacturers that received the medicine patent pool voluntary licensing agreement from Merck's Monopiravir, uh, those manufacturers are those that we, six of them are those that we had helped to build the foundation for GMP compliance, right? So they are ready to go. They can now participate and help uh, in, in, during this uh, period. And then uh, some of the countries where manufacturers had indicated interest to place some role in COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing are uh, countries we worked. And, and quickly to say that another aspect of this really is also the, beyond the disease burden angle is the diversification of global supply, right? Uh, we have to address that. That is what is the challenge now we saw with COVID-19. Uh, and so it helps uh, when these sources of producing this product are diversified, it helps to reduce vulnerability in the global supply chain. You know, so maybe diversification should be something that should also be a factor in defining uh, uh, local uh, production. Then lastly, to get into aspect of your question about uh, evolving, how things have evolved, I think there's no game saying that vaccine need and inequities that have surrounded that um, is brought to bear 
uh, greater attention also vaccines as a medical product. So not just only pharmaceuticals, but vaccine. And I agree entirely with Ian that it has to be the entire medical products. Uh, but I will say that um, the announcement just last week that WHO of the Global mRNA Technology Transfer Hub is, is a case in point that just like what happened previously with telecommunication industry and the host of others, where low and Lincoln country, you know, uh, leapfrog technology. This may be happening in Africa, and we look forward to really uh, uh, supporting and working with that. Another area is technology transfer. We know that uh, um, new technologies, uh, you know, require a lot of uh, support to be able to succeed, whether in terms of the technical information or the tacit know how or the skills that are needed, the materials that could be submitted. And, and that leads me to my last point, I think, is across all this is the huge need for workforce, scientific and technical workforce that can enable those countries, whichever way we define it, we call sources of local production of pharmaceuticals and medical products, we have to build our workforce. And that's an area where we've been spending tons of time and resources on, and we intend to do a lot more because that is at the heart of this. We really suddenly have to teach and uh, build that capacity for quality CMC issues, for, for uh, facility issues, for, for lot release issues, uh, for dosage review and evaluation for biopharmaceutical products. These countries have not gone through that. So in closing, I, I will again argue that most important objective of local production, it seems to me, will be to produce, to meet the health burden, the health burden of the country and the region. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Jude, and thanks for sharing that, um, those many rich examples. I'd like to turn the floor over to Prashant for your thoughts on this question. Thanks, Alison, and uh, great to be here. Very interesting topic of discussion and great panelists. I uh, want to start by saying semantics do matter here because they become very quickly a part of the political narrative and thereafter, um, you know, opinion ratings and polls and lots of things start converging around the semantics use. So I feel that saying local, like I think Ian said, some others have said, and, and I think most panelists also mentioned that it's not just for your own country, for your neighbor. So in a way we are um, talking about regional and local signifies some idea of supply chain autarky that every medical supply chain has to be fully self-reliant. That is by no means, uh, what I think this is seeking, we ought to not confound more distributed manufacturing and less geographically concentrated manufacturing with local manufacturing. Right? The former are important. Uh, that need we've recognized and you know, everybody has to work on it, but that doesn't necessarily translate into local production because local means that we give up on the idea of global value chains in health technology production and manufacturing, which has serious costs, which I don't think our resource constrained environment can bear. So one thing uh, is, that is important to keep in mind. Then I think um, when we talk about regional, um, how has this changed? So I think a lot of things have changed on the supply side. New technology has become available, which allows manufacturing at smaller scale. We hear about new flexible and and modular manufacturing setups. So manufacturing technology is changing rapidly. It is allowing us to make things which were more difficult to make in a distributed sense and the cost economics of that are becoming more attractive. So that's a supply side trend. Technology and manufacturing is evolving rapidly. Continuous will be the future. Batch will not be our predominant modality for manufacturing, whether it's small molecules, uh, even biologics in the future. So that's something you've got to keep in mind. That changes the COGS equation uh, in interesting ways. Sometimes it helps regional, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, that equation needs to be very carefully thought through uh, because otherwise the na narrative becomes everything can be done regional, everything can be done local. So that's the first part. Then I think um, the um, other thing that has evolved very rapidly is the idea that if you do regional manufacturing, it requires a route to market and a supply chain to distribute. So one example would be rapid diagnostic tests and lateral flow test manufacturing. We are seeing regional, there are good initiatives that we can do this regionally. This is one technology where regional can work. 
this proven to work um, is lateral flow test manufacturing, right? Um, and then the question is, if you manufacture them at one hub location in, let's say, West Africa or East Africa, do you then have the supply chain and distribution systems to get the product to all markets in the region? Early and preliminary experiences from such initiatives point us to the fact that it's not as easy. Um, so I think we cannot decouple manufacturing from route to market supply chain and distribution. If we think regional, then we need regional footprint of supply chain and distribution. That is evolving slower because the political capital and the political headwind has indexed or over-indexed itself on manufacturing without necessarily also thinking about regional distribution. So that's the second uh, thing which I think has evolved or not truly evolved. The third thing is that um, while the supply side equation is getting a lot of attention and as a supply chain academic, I love the fact that you know, heads of state talk about supply chain manufacturing networks, diversified manufacturing. The reality is that for this to be sustainable, it has to be accompanied with a demand side equal effort um, initiative. And by demand side, I mean purchasers. This would include both global purchasers, but even more importantly, domestic purchasers to rethink how they procure. If we say we want to continue procuring using the L1 lowest price bidder gets 100% of the tender contract, then none of the regional manufacturers are going to be L1 in the short term. I mean, that's just reality, it's candor. Uh, anybody who's looked at manufacturing scale and cost of goods production knows that. So if we want to change that, we also have to think about changing procurement, bringing diversity and split tender awards in which L1 doesn't get the entire 100%, L1 gets some portion, but the remaining portion is given for other reasons. That reform is not evolving, neither on the financing side nor on the procurement reform side. So I think if you ask me how have things evolved, well, lots of things are getting attention, very good, very interesting. Some things are not, and I think we ought to focus our attention on bringing equal attention to those parts if we want to think about the entire system. The last thing I want to mention is that when we think about regional manufacturing, I think we have to keep in mind that the future market will remain uncertain, especially, for example, the discussions that are happening on manufacturing uh, COVID vaccines or new vaccines uh, re more regionally, whether it's in Africa or LATAM or Asia. I think we have to keep in mind the future of this market or any health technology market comes with significant uncertainty. We will not be able to resolve that uncertainty anytime soon because the platforms are uncertain. What will make us, um, what will be the right technology for the future is uncertain. So we need two things. We need greater flexibility. If we are setting up a new regional manufacturing plan today, I think we ought to keep in mind flexibility uh, so that it can switch from one product type to another, one manufacturing plant, plant to uh, one manufacturing platform to another uh, relatively quickly. And that's a leapfrog opportunity, right? Our current distribution networks are not as flexible. The ones that exist in North America and Europe, in India and Asia, they are not very flexible, but we have a real opportunity here to build more flexible manufacturing uh, in the regional sites that come up in the future, what products will we make in them, how that's an important area to discuss. And I think uh, we can talk more about what USAID can do, but anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, why don't we flip quickly to our poll and see how the audience responded to the question. Um, so it looks like in terms of the primary benefits of of producing locally, we saw that improving commodity security came in as the number one important benefit. And secondarily, we see that improved access to safe and quality assured local, from local sources. And, and it's great to see in third place, um, more of an economic priority here to ensure that um, not only is there availability of product, but that the marketplace can become more responsive and from a competitive perspective. In the interest of time, let's go to the next question. Uh, 
Great. So, um, Jude, how would you like to handle this question? What are what are some of the benefits if you want to build upon your opening remarks of, of producing local, locally? Right. Thank you, Christine. Uh, yeah, and I think there are there are so many benefits, and and some of them have come out in in some of the remarks of uh, my fellow panelists. And I think the ultimately, and very much like the 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 pool that you're sh uh, showing on the screen right now, ultimately. It is that uh, uh, you know supply security concern. Why did this topic all of it, all of a sudden become at the top of everybody's mind now? It's because of COVID nineteen. We turned the we, we we the world basically just saw the need for this, and the world saw also the fact that there is tremendous uh, inequities. Uh, in fact, at times I say that. I don't know why inequities and iniquities seem to sound alike, but you know we are seeing situation where people cannot agree to the fact that they cannot have access to medicines that are impacting their population. So I think the very first one is really improving access and health security. That's one of the most important benefits. And, and Ian, and would you like to add a benefit as well? Yeah, I'll give you two. I mean, obviously the resilience and reliability is important, but what, what we saw with COVID was that remote procurement doesn't work in terms of maximizing on-shelf availability, uh, especially in times of rapid scale up and variable requirement. So it, let's not just see what happened in COVID as being a COVID thing. It was the ultimate demonstration of a failed supply chain model. So it's shown us that that's a big benefit of the event. I think one of the big advantages of local manufacturer, regional manufacturer, domestic manufacturer, and Christy's probably going to take me on about this is, yeah, we need strong regulators, but we need standard regulators. If we're going to build manufacturing capacity to economies of scale, we need to have the same standards across multiple markets. We can't have one pack for this little market and one pack for that little market and a different one over here. So as we build those strong authorities, let's make sure we use this opportunity to drive standardization as well. And this has not been a new conversation. Certainly, this conversation has always been a, in, involved in our conversations. I think, you know, um, I've had the pleasure over the last ten years just engaging with the panelists in various capacities. So, uh, Jude, to your point, it, it is it is great that now that COVID has kind of heightened our awareness of these vulnerabilities. It's it's good that we have a, a collective movement to be able to to act on how we can look at. Um, more regional African uh, manufacturing as an option. I think with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Allison for our next question. Yeah, thank you so much, Christine. And if the producers wouldn't mind just pulling up the results for our second poll, um, we now wanted to also uh, get some responses from the audience about the main challenges that need to be addressed in terms of expanding efforts around local and regional production. And so, uh, the font is a little bit small on my screen, but let me just read out the top responses that we received here. Um, so first around the cost competitiveness of certain products, and then also um, difficulty in reaching economies of scale. Second, in terms of local administrative, regulatory, and legal challenges, something that we've certainly discussed a little bit so far um, in the first part of our conversation. And then the third uh, major challenge that was identified was in terms of infrastructure and workforce challenges. And we can see that there's a few others listed here and we'd certainly invite um, our audience to add any additional responses in the chat as well. But I'd like to just invite Christy if you'd like to um, come back on, on camera and um, comment on, on this uh, question in particular. And also um, just to add, if you'd like to also comment on some of um, you know, the impacts of COVID-19 um, on this context as well. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so, of course, again, coming from primarily a quality perspective, uh, one of the biggest challenges really is ensuring that the manufacturing sites employ good manufacturing practices. And in order for this to happen, key elements need to be in place. And I'll just highlight a few of those. Uh, number one, there needs to be significant capital to ensure that the facilities, the equipment, the instruments, the HVAC systems, the water, the laboratories, 
that they all meet appropriate standards. And oftentimes the capital is not readily available for this. Um, additionally, there's costs associated with APIs and, and excipients that may need to be imported, which increase costs. Um, there needs to be a skilled workforce and the ability to maintain that workforce. As we know, oftentimes uh, as employees learn skills and mature, they move on. And so ensuring that there's a skilled workforce to backfill key positions are pertinent. And that means ensuring that the local universities are able to support such a, such a workforce. Um, there can be challenges with equipment maintenance and, and having in-house capability as well as uh, um, obtaining contracts for servicing equipment. We've seen challenges with dossiers that are weak. Um, they may lack the uh, evidence to support key things such as stability data or, or bioequivalent studies and things like that. And I know um, hats off to our, our PQM um, plus colleagues who, who work quite a bit in that arena. Um, but again, I go back, perhaps one of the biggest drivers again is, is a mature regulatory authority that consistently oversees sites and ensures compliance to best practices. Uh, you know, as our role uh, uh, as the QA contractor, we oftentimes conduct audits and we know that, uh, that audits are a point in time. And with an exodus of skilled staff, uh, the quality culture at a manufacturing site could quickly wane. And so having a mature regulatory authority that's conducting um, inspections routinely, uh, um, but there's also the element of ensuring that any manufacturing changes are reported and approved. And, and uh, also that means that there's a functioning feedback loop such that if there are adverse events that happen, there's a feedback loop for reporting uh, uh, pharmacovigilance, if you will. All these efforts provide a greater level of confidence that the products being manufactured or distributed locally, regionally, wherever, that, that gives that confidence. What is somewhat of a unique challenge for us uh, is, is what is ensuring that there's an incentive for the manufacturer that may already be approved by their national regulatory authority to legally manufacture products without implementing some of the things that we're uh, suggesting here. Um, you know, why would they invest money in doing all these additional efforts if, if their own regulatory authority is not requiring that? So that those things need to be congruent. So all this to say that it's, it's not Easy. It's not impossible, certainly. I'm not, I'm not being a pessimist, but um, these things need to be in place uh, and the necessary controls, processes, and procedures. And, and we would have to ask, you know, what is USAID's risk tolerance for failure? Um, and the reason I say that, certainly if things happen with manufacturers where there's sophisticated, mature regulatory authorities, things happen. And so, ensuring that we have a certain risk tolerance for, for that. Um, and it's because of this that we say, when we're developing procurement strategies, maybe start with low risk products, maybe start with manufacturing processes that are not so complex. And when I say low risk products there, I mean, I, I caveat this though, depending on the failure type, but a product that where there would be minimal patient impacts if there was a failure, uh, again, for starters, uh, things like um, non-sterile creams or lower risk orals versus injectable products or products with narrow therapeutic windows where the margin of error is very slim. And so uh, coming to COVID and challenges, I mean, all the challenges that I just mentioned become multiplied uh, when you have a, a pandemic. And we don't cur currently deal with a lot of local manufacturers, but certainly there are notable issues with the international ones, such as reduced staffing levels at facilities, which means QA, QC uh, units are delayed in releasing lots. There are supply chain issues, pickup delays, uh, container availability, um, impact to access to key starting materials. Um, so, these are just a few challenges that I wanted to highlight and I'm sure my colleagues will add to that discussion. So thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. And Khalid, I'd like to turn it over to you if there's anything you'd like to add from the Pakistan context briefly.
Okay. Sorry, I was not getting uh, unmuted. <laughs> I think you can hear me now. Yes, no problem. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think this is great discussion and I see um, the challenges. Uh, everybody is talking from their context and it's very, very relevant. Uh, um, relevant here. It's only their severity or uh, focus in certain settings. Uh, if I look at Pakistan, uh, Pakistan is, as I earlier mentioned, there is only 100 uh, top level pharmaceuticals that are getting to the 97% of the market. So in such kind of setting, it, it's so hard for the rest of the uh, market or pharmaceutical companies to get an opportunity to contribute or get chances or opportunities to build their capacity. Uh, that's that's something that is not even listed in those challenges, but it's a big challenge for Pakistan. Uh, and that's where uh, I thank uh, COVID pandemic, which actually came uh, with some uh, development uh, financing and we got this opportunity to look into this market and identify those potential manufacturers who had the capacity, who wanted to expand, um, improve upon their infrastructure, their human resources, and um, their uh, even technology transfers. They mentioned that they were either they were able to uh, procure or uh, needed help from uh, uh, donors or developed partners. So. Uh, there are uh, existing challenges skill of skilled personnel, uh, um, unavailability, you know, investment capital that is required, uh, technologies, regulatory and policy environment is also another uh, factor. But uh, uh, I see where uh, lots of development partners are focusing on uh, service delivery, uh, maternal and child health, family planning, but then quality of medicine and then building the capacity of uh, local pharmaceutical companies to ensure that these, these capacities improve upon, it's, it's very pertinent. I think among those challenges uh, for a budding um, pharma industry, it's, it's very important to first demonopolize uh, the overall uh, uh, environment and then move on addressing those uh, additional challenges. Certainly, uh, as um, uh, earlier mentioned, that uh, these challenges are uh, affecting countries uh, even before COVID and even with COVID, uh, many countries uh, had more problems even when the, uh, several countries banned exports of equipment and machinery and APIs. So these uh, problems were ex exacerbated, but I see this as a challenge also and see how other countries globally have addressed those issues or challenges and then learning, taking that learning and then implementing in other con uh, in countries where those best practices can, could be uh, applied and uh, local production could be improved, that those challenges could be minimized uh, so that people have access to quality uh, medical products. So I think uh, I, I, I would stop here to, um, to see um, any additional inputs from other colleagues. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Halid. And I think um, we'll invite Prashant if you'd like to add anything else on this question before we move on to the next question. Thanks, Alison. I, uh, I'll be very short, and um, but I feel some of the reasons that have come out here, I would agree with them, but I think if you go one level deeper and ask uh, questions as to why aren't we uh, achieving economies of scale um, or regulatory challenges, I think a diff slightly different root cause picture emerges. So first thing um, is related to capital. I think I hear two versions of the story, so it is in, in a way you know, tricky. On one side, we have a lot of unspent capital sitting at development finance institutions, which had earmarked pots of money to invest in regional manufacturing in diversified manufacturing, whether it is our USDFC, or it is the IFC or CDC or British Foreign Investment Corporation, they could not find 
deals which did not have a demand side risk. Right? They are willing to take some supply side risk, which is yes, they don't have staff, we'll get them staff over time, but is there a clear buyer in the market who will continue to buy from these? So what is currently written as sixth, which is insufficient demand from local market, in my opinion, is a much bigger challenge. If you look at the out-of-pocket market for pharmaceuticals in many of the countries, it is largely indexed on foreign and imported pro pro product. And that goes back to Christie's comment on regulation, which is people's perception is higher quality comes from production, which is occurring elsewhere. Uh, when you look at public procurement tenders, it's a similar story. Either it's a cost or um, you know, just the quality reg regulatory uh, apparatus uh, then indexes on um, other larger producers, right? So unless the demand side can be fixed, uh, we, we can't resolve the supply side problems. We have capital. Capital will become available if it's already not available in the DFIs and big, big tranches. Um, I think it's about solving the demand side issues. And then on regulatory, I think one interesting thing that has continued to um, come up in discussions every time we've talked about it with leadership in, in different countries, health sector leadership in different countries is um, the global purchasing for generic medicines from India, for example, started long before India's drug regulatory authority achieved the maturity level status uh, that it has now achieved which means we were using, whether it was the PQ program or specialized lot testing programs created by the buyers of such products to ensure quality. We were not waiting for the national regulator to reach a maturity level of four or five, right? So many health ministers in the low and middle income countries are asking a question, why now suddenly and ask that our national regulator should at least be maturity level four before we can embark in a local production environment, whereas you were buying long before many of the producing countries had reached a maturity level four, right? So, so we have to keep that in mind. I am a strong proponent that we should focus on national regulatory capacity strengthening, but we also have to give importance and saliency to this point, which is rightfully brought up by many health ministers who are embarking on local production journeys. Uh, so anyway, I'll, watch, I'll stop it. Next slide, please. I think we're going in the, one more, please. So um, we, we do wanna make sure we can see how we can practically at USAID in, in, in create an enabling environment that would allow for more local manufacturing. We've heard from our panelists about um, procurement reform, how we have to think about structuring the tenders. We've heard about from, from some of the questions that have come through, we've heard about how um, importation levies can, can be different depending on importation of APIs already going to set a company at a higher price as opposed to companies that are able to import final formulations um, getting a, a tax levy from the government. So how can we engage with um, our trade counterparts in these governments in addition to engaging with the National Medicines Regulatory Authority? Um, how else can USAID and other development partners support local regional manufacturing and, and this enabling environment. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'd like to hear from all of the panelists on this question. Why don't we start with, with Ian, please? Yeah, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna duck your question on what else, Christine, because I wanna circle back on something again. And you know my propensity for sound bites and bumper stickers, and I, I promise this is not a, a bumper sticker for, uh, for uh, the administrator, uh, administrative power, but, your bumper sticker is, play it again, Sam. 17 years ago, Indian manufacturers didn't have the quality standards. USAID initiated, initiated a policy and a practice that said, if you build it, we will buy. And in the space of a very short period of years, we saw not only single and then multiple manufacturers move to the quality standards that is necessary in order to be able to supply into these markets, we saw 
a highly competitive landscape develop within Indian pharmaceutical manufacturing. And so you, you have it in your power. Set the standards, coach them to the standards, and then buy your stuff from them and make that commitment. And then, as Prashant points out, the investors will line up in order to be able to capitalize those enterprises for them to be able to respond to that promise. And so the power that you possess as the major donors, not only in terms of setting the standards, and coaching to the standards, but then rewarding people's efforts to meet those standards is the most important power that you have. You also have the political support and the political power to be able to force these trade um, issues uh, around taxation incentives. So, and often it's not just the governments of the countries that we're talking to that need to make changes. It's actually for them to understand that to level the playing field, they have to counter the incentives that have been given on the other side. So the incentives that have been given for exportation out of India, if you want to be able to compete, we have to allow people to be able to counter for those incentives because we're not going to get the Indian government to change those standards. Yeah? So being willing to have the hard fights on the trade issues, I think, is the other thing that's really, really important. And then the last thing that I would say in terms of what you can be doing directly, you've got a great big uh, blended finance and innovative finance uh, unit within the organization. Let's put it to work. Let's get it out there looking for investments where concessionary capital, innovative financing models will enable the, uh, the crowding in of private sector capital into those enterprises so that we can actually create the businesses, create the structures and deliver the products. Thank you, over to Christine. Thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, just to add, and uh, I, I really appreciate the comments from uh, Prashant and Ian uh, regarding the regulatory authorities. Um, just to say that, you know, from our perspective, we would not, we're not suggesting to not procure um, uh, where the quality standards may not be where we would like for them to be, but rather that we look at it from a risk-based approach. And as we're building the capacity, maybe having some starting points um, with lower risk products that we're, we're really willing to support as we continue to build that, that capacity. Um, and then in terms of other uh, support, um, as I mentioned in the challenges earlier, um, investments in supporting programs at local universities that would help with development of, of a technical workforce that we'd be looking for to help uh, maintain certain standards. Um, and when we're looking at maybe products to support local procurement, uh, uh, local manufacturing, there should be some sophistication around the strategy behind the products that are, are, are selected. Um, for example, um, we probably would not want to develop or, or implement quite a bit of time and money and effort in supporting products um, for, for products where treatment regimens are constantly changing. So what happens if we invest all this time and money and then only for a year later or two years later, the, the regimen changes, but in the, with the manufacturing site be able to diversify. So, you know, some, some strategic thinking around the products that, uh, that USAID would want to support. Um, and finally, uh, uh, coming back to, and I, and I think um, Prashant touched on this earlier, um, we've had several discussions with our procurement colleagues and we understand that uh, the local manufacturing and local manufactured products are not always the lowest cost. And so would USAID be willing to pay a premium for, uh, for local products to, to help this along? Um, we understand with that there could be some challenges because the manufacturer may not always be able to compete from a volume uh, perspective from timelines and what have you, and again, cost. But perhaps there could be an additional or a higher rating for a product that's manufactured locally to be part of the procurement rules. Um, uh, and so USAID would maybe need to consider uh, 
you know, what is the tolerance for potentially paying more for, for a local product uh, to, to be able to usher in this effort. So, um, yeah, thanks. Over yeah, you. that's an interesting point about the higher price premium. And I know Christy, you and I have discussed this over, over the last few years. I think um, if we could find a way to maybe quantify some of the non-direct costs and non-direct benefits of, of um, let's just call it regional manufacturing, um, I think it'd be easier to, to be able to reform the policy regarding procurement. So if we could quantify economic development or quantify um, human capital uh, retainment somehow, that, that helps to kind of counteract some of the, the higher commodity, the higher, the higher price premium. Um, Rashad, uh, would you like to offer your thoughts as well? Okay, I couldn't, uh, I didn't have control to unmute. Thank you, Christine. I want to build on what you just said about uh, the premium. So I think uh, this is an important area without a procurement change, um, many of the other efforts will not yield the outcomes we are seeking. I commend the work that PQM does that we do around building the local manufacturer's capacity, regulatory capacity and so on. But at the end of this, there has to be uh, purchasing. And there, I think the cost equation is where some of the biggest barriers lie. Uh, I, I mean, yes, we can go down the journey of thinking about why pay a premium because it leads to economic development, human capital development. But I think the risk diversification and the resilience premium, I've been using this and I have you know, work on this, which I'm happy to send around your way, um, that if you think about geographical diversification and the need for resilience and supply security as a global public good, we all benefit collectively from it, not just the country in which that local producer is located. That's when we can say we want to spend taxpayer dollars on a resilience premium because we all collectively will get the benefits of supply security, right? So we've got to outline it in the right manner. Uh, that's one. The second is, I think USAID has um, a, a, a lot of potential of using demand side work, whether it is designing uh, demand side guarantee instruments, which other DFIs and, and DFC and others could join in, but you know, USAID could take the lead in how to how to design them. Uh, which product categories, which therapeutic areas, which regions do they matter more, and how? Um, also, what Christie said around procurement reform or procurement modalities. I think this once again gets into what would be the market shaping strategy, and how much will it attach weight to purchasing such. Uh, resilience enhancing manufacturers products uh, that once again goes into uh, directly of the kind of work that you lead and and you, know, you all can can influence in, in in significant ways so that's one but the other part is on the supply side i mean i think we see that i mean jude bought this up um you see that the work that has happened on the voluntary licenses for monopiravir uh, what is happening with the MPP and uh, for Paxlovid and other COVID therapeutics. I mean, that is also an opportunity to think about manufacturers who are receiving such licenses. The market side seems to be a little bit more working there. Um, what can USA do to make sure that those things happen at the right quality, they happen fast enough, they happen in ways that those manufacturers find it sustainable to be in that business. I think those would be areas which I think there is an immediate sort of time limited opportunity for USA to do something which fits in the area of local manufacturing, but also fits in the area of improving access to COVID therapeutics uh, globally. So that's another area I would highlight. And the last thing I would mention uh, is USA has uh, a lot of uh, connects with both on the country procurement side, how, th how this happens, the country distribution side, but 
when there are efforts happening around local and regional manufacturing, trying to connect them with regional distribution, regional supply chain, supply chain enhancement, so that those two pieces do not work as decoupled pieces. They have to be more tightly coupled together. And I think that's probably an important area for the agency to, to think about. Thank you. Great. Um, and maybe Jude, if you want to give, um, and, and then followed by Khalid, if you'd like to give a closing thought. And then if we have time, we'll, we'll look at the question. All right. No, thanks, Christine. And uh, I think uh, time is running out. So I will just say that uh, this is a topic that has been discussed pre uh, a lot. And uh, we actually have two publications on investment priorities, uh, both for local production as well as for strengthening regulatory agencies. And uh, you know, if there's an interest, I'll send the link for that. But what, what is typically common about this is that we have to have a complete mindset shift to be able to even get to uh, uh, be, you know, converge on what we recommend to USAID and to uh, development partners to support. Uh, we have to have a mindset that really first agrees that advocacy for local production does not in any way mean advocacy for poor quality. There's only one GMP standard. So it is to, you know, the most important thing is to the extent that we can all say, look, we need more sources. The, you know, we need other people that can make this product and we need to be able to invest to build their capacity to make that product. I've met CEOs, too numerous to mention, They've told me that this is their vision and mission, and they are ready to invest as needed and learn the technology that is required. Thank you. And Khaled? Thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, I think um, most uh, has been said, uh, and I agree with the most of what has already been said. But I think uh, for USAID, uh, I see that uh, in Pakistan, it was first time that USAID uh, started looking at quality of medicine. No other development partner looked at the quality of uh, uh, medical products uh, or equipment or pharmaceuticals. I, it was strange when uh, PQM went out and met and looked at uh, different stakeholders and uh, what they are doing. Uh, people people looked at like uh, amazed uh, uh, that this is something new that is coming but i think in a uh, in an unregulated or uh, less regulated setting like pakistan the first uh, uh, priority was to regulate it as much as possible uh, build human resource capacities to uh, go out into market and look at the medical products available in the local market and then devise systems to uh, fill the gaps, quality gaps. And I think that's where PQM started working in Pakistan and uh, moved and did a lot of progress. Um, the second thing I would add here is the lack of data. Based on our work in other uh, areas, uh, service delivery, um, uh, supply chain, health systems. I think we have learned that wherever there is data available, it's easy for the government, for the development partners, for the private sector to make quick decisions and allocate resources. Unfortunately, in the private sector, there is very little data available, including pharmaceutical sector, uh, uh, public health labs in the private sector, and so many other areas within the private sector which uh, minimizes the visibility into what is the actual problem in, in a certain setting, especially um, if I'm talking about Pakistan. I think we, it was first time that we, when we started talking to the manufacturers, we realized that uh, there is 80 to 90% manufacturers who had the capacity, who wanted to improve their uh, production lines, but there was nobody who would let them come in the mainstream and contribute or expand their capacity. I think so. Um, for USAID, I will uh, I will just uh, summarize it that 
for USAID to be very, very strategic, engage and uh, with development partners, advocate uh, to work hand in hand in different technical areas so that uh, not only the public sector, because so far our work has been mostly uh, to support the public sector, not the private sector. Even if you look at the current work, we are supporting the public sector. And by virtue of supporting the public sector, the Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan, the Ministry of Health, indirectly we are impacting uh, uh, private sector or pharmaceutical sector. It's only because of COVID uh, that, that we went ahead and made direct contacts with the private sector. But I think we need to expand a little bit more to uh, include in our programming and in our designs, the private sector, uh, so that we, we work with them, understand their challenges and create win-win situations because working with private sector uh, requires another set of, uh, you know, skill sets and uh, diplomacy, uh, unlike uh, the, mm, the work with the public sector. So I think uh, we just need to consider some of these aspects when we are thinking to work with the private sector and pharmaceutical industry. Over. Thank you so much um, to all of our rich discussions from the panelists. Um, I, I think what I've taken away from this is really to <clears throat> consider how we can look at procurement reform, how we can engage better with the private sector and look at some of the, the development financing organizations that are available. How can we um, ensure that the data that we have available for demand is robust to create an environment where companies are gonna see that they need to, to participate in this marketplace and that they would want to participate in this marketplace because they can see clear returns on investment for raising that level of quality. And I think um, all of this really cannot be done in the absence of a, a strong regulatory system. However, we shouldn't wait until um, in, in light of the new WHO listed authorities designations, we shouldn't wait for necessarily all authorities to get to a four or five before we can deem that deem the products available in those countries available for procurement. So I think um, I, I do want to extend my sincere gratitude to all of the panelists. And um, at this point, I would like to um, pass it back to Allison for her closing remarks as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. And again, huge thanks to our panelists today. I think this was a really robust discussion. Um, also, just a couple quick administrative notes as we close out. We wanted to thank again the audience for submitting your questions. Um, we've taken note of those and we'll do our best to post responses um, on the Market Links website. And also just wanted to take a moment um, to remind everybody that all of the materials for this webinar will be posted on the Market Links website along with a couple of blogs that we've written um, on the topic as well. So we certainly encourage you to check those out um, when you have a moment. And uh, again, just thanks to our MarketLinks colleagues for making this possible.